What's going on everybody? It is the OCPD coach and here with another video. It has been a minute, honestly, since I have dropped a full length video, you might've noticed I've been doing a lot of shorts. Shorts has really helped me grow the channel past anything I've been able to do with the long form videos. I have, I think I'm currently sitting at about 120 subscribers. Before I started doing shorts, I think I was stuck at about 40 subscribers. And the engagement with those videos as well has been much more than what I traditionally get. I know it's YouTube's algorithm, how the video gets out to people, where they're able to find it, the different tags you use, the different labels, thumbnails, all of that stuff that I honestly, I'm not a YouTuber. I have no time or desire to really spend a lot of time learning about how to master all of those different aspects. However, I do want to say thank you to all of the new subscribers. Thank you to all of the subscribers who have remained subscribed since the earlier days. I think we're going on a year pretty soon. I'm not sure of the exact date, but I know we're going on a year pretty soon of how long the channel has been up. And I've just really had one video, a single video that I, I was able to use Opus Clip, which is an AI video editing software that takes a video and crops it and chops it and does what it needs to do to distribute it. So I've had one video up that was chopped up going out every other day with just a different portion of it. And while I think that's awesome, that is bringing a lot of people to the channel, I don't think people who see that video really understand the full scope of what the channel is really desired to, is really out to do, which is to, first of all, educate people who are unaware of OP, OCPD, as well as other mental health issues such as ADHD and even OCD, because I struggle with all three of those. Um, it's also meant to showcase to the world what it's like to deal with those mental health struggles and how it impacts somebody like me day to day. And it is also obviously a funnel because if I have individuals who find out they have some of these different symptoms or some of the traits, then they can come to me and for either sign up for coaching or reach out with questions or even just continue to get the content, get some free resources. And they could also potentially get to other people as well, because if they have therapists in the area who can help them or if they're able to show this video and say, hey, this is some of the stuff that I deal with. So maybe show it to their significant other or a parent or a child and say, can you hold me accountable to make sure that I don't struggle as much in these areas? I still think all of these are different funnels for information, not just to me, but to other people in the family. So. The channel really is here to help in different ways. If you can't tell, this time I didn't come with a script. I normally have a PowerPoint slide that I put together. However, I just wrote a couple of notes because I really want to be more personal, personal with you all. I don't want it to be where I come off like a salesman because honestly, I'm not a salesman. I, I've done sales, but if I was a salesman, I probably would be a lot more successful financially. Um, I'm really the type of person where I love people. I, I love people. I love everybody I come into contact with. It seems like I'm able to find some form of bond, form some form of bond with them or find something that is positive about that individual or something even if they need help. I'm oftentimes a lot of people bring stuff to me and dump it on me. Um, so I really love people and I really wanted to take this time to talk directly to you all, not from a PowerPoint slide, but just hitting some of the key points that I have highlighted. I also think this type of content, if this is chopped up and turned into a short, then that's helpful as well. But people who like long form content, maybe you're washing the, washing the dishes or doing something else and you just want to hear somebody talk, I'm your guy. So let's hop into it a little bit. I want to briefly talk about what the purpose of this video is. The purpose of this video, number one, is to update you all on the channel, myself. This is not a channel where I have abandoned it, which I'm very happy to say. I've been able to have videos consistently going out each month. And I, again, directed all of my energy towards shorts because that is what's actually moving the traffic for the channel. The other thing I want to do with this, with this video is talk about 
something very near and dear to me, which is game development and how mental health can impact game development overall and how it has impacted me because I have been doing game development since 2014. Yeah, since 2014, I've been doing game development. So this is a great opportunity for me to talk about that. I, I keep looking down because I'm in my head. It's late at night, but I'm in my head. I've been doing Toastmasters where we do public speaking. I have a tendency to not end my sentences. I will keep saying and why we use a different conjunction to go to the next sentence. I'm trying to get better with that. Bear with me. Purpose is out the way. A few updates about me. So I've been heavily involved with church and there it is again. And um, tomorrow my church is doing a huge event. We're expecting over a thousand people. This is my second week as an uh, officially as a leader for our parking department at our church. This was not an opportunity that I saw coming up. It was something where there was a need. I'm able to feel the need. So that's where I'm at. Beyond honored to even be considered for the role. Also, I get an opportunity to work more closely with the other leaders of the church, see how things run behind the scenes, get a feel for how everything is put together because I'm big on systems. I love systems. So yeah, we got a big event tomorrow. So I will be going to bed a little bit earlier than I normally do, just so I can be prepared for that. I don't know if I if I made mention of this since my last since it happened, but I am now officially a certified product owner. This is something that I love product. I love creating stuff. I love solving needs, solving problems, seeing where needs are for customers, and being a certified product owner, a Scrum product owner. I went through Scrum Alliance, which is one of the best certification programs out there, I've been told. It is something that has given me more legitimacy to myself, not even with coaching. That's not what I'm talking about, but any projects that I have where I have an idea and I need to bring it to life. Now I have different strategies on how to plan, plan everything out. I have different strategies to help me with seeing it all the way through to completion. And I have different strategies to help me gauge metrics to make sure it was something that succeeded instead of just throwing stuff out there and seeing what sticks to the wall. Now I can do it a lot more planned, organized, and less emotionally. I can use more data, more um, statistics to actually craft whatever I'm crafting. So that's something I'm very proud of. And talk briefly, I want to talk briefly about just some client success. I've had the same client since I started. My first ever coaching client that I had when I offered the free coaching program, he signed up for six weeks for free. He has been paying ever since that six weeks, he's been a paid client. And we have renewed all the way up until November of next year. That's how much he has gotten out of the program. He's been able to do different things such as becoming an official citizen, getting the citizenship in Canada, which was something he kept putting off. And the coaching working with me, we, we were able to knock it out. He is officially certified and it is TESOL certification. It is Eng English as a second language. So he's officially certified. This was something when we first spoke, he didn't know where the papers were. It was something he needed to do and he just could not bring it to the forefront. Kept pushing them, kept working together, coming up with different strategies on the phone together, trying to make sure we can do things, pushing him out of his comfort zone. So that was another thing that was really, really big with this was pushing him out of his comfort zone. And um, he wanted to keep pushing off, taking the test. And I said, hey, can you just take it, take it tomorrow or take it today? I forgot which one it was, but he did it. And actually, that was for the apologies. The test was not for the certification. That was for the citizenship. But he aced the test instead of having to wait days and days. The certification, he was able to reach out to all the schools, get the transcripts, get everything he needed. He's continuing to just improve in different areas. The other client that I'm working with right now is a young man who graduated from college and he's in the gaming realm. So this is somebody who he really wants to focus on getting a job in game development or software engineer, but he has a passion and a love for game development. I have been working with him for 
probably about five weeks now and we're just getting into it we're, we're getting into it. right now my goal is working on presentation how we present ourselves how we carry ourselves making ourselves attractive to companies so that companies want us more than we want them and that is that is something that it's a lot of rewiring that you do to get to the point where you can really be comfortable and say, hey, I'm happy with what I put out there. I'm happy with the image I put out there. I'm happy with myself as a brand because we don't often get taught to make a brand. I know in high school we didn't, but every single thing you do relates back to your brand. If you, the language you're using, the avatar that you have on social media, the different things that you repost, how you carry yourself, how you dress, how you communicate with other people in public, your family life, personal life, your friend choice, all of this stuff, email address, something as simple as that. All of this stuff relates back to your personal brand, your personal image. So I'm not an image consultant, but as a coach, I do everything that I can to help my clients succeed at whatever their goals are. And that has been one of the biggest things I've been doing with my current client. And um, another update, I have been off from my, I'm a software engineer full time and I've been off for the past two weeks. It's some personal stuff that personally professional stuff that really sparked this need for me to take some time off, but I'm very, very happy I did. And I was able to, during this time, work on a project that has been more of a, a spiritual calling than anything. So I really, 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 really can't wait to show you all what I've been working on. It is something that I hope you all will enjoy. I'm not 100% sure if you all like games, whoever's watching this, but even if you can't, I hope that you can learn from me because all of this relates back to OCPD. We're gonna now start transitioning into that topic, into the topic of game development, how it relates to my OCPD, my mental health, how everything is connected because at the end of the day, if you have OCPD, you come on this channel and I'm talking about game development, you're confused, I get it. If you're coming onto my channel as somebody who's a game developer or a gamer and you're wanting to learn about a video game and I'm talking about mental health, you're confused, I get it. All this connects though. Let's see, got a couple books out. All right, so I want to start back in, let's start in first grade. Really quickly. So I'll give you a quick story about myself because I think that's the best way for me to teach. Because I only know me. I've always drawn. I've always been an artist. Even since I was young, I would always draw trucks. I would draw very, very detailed trucks. And this is where the attention to detail started at a young age. And I had no idea. But I would, my grandfather had a red Mack truck. It was a box Mack truck. And it was a dump truck. So it was very sharp edges, the grill. It was square. It wasn't the rounded edge grills that you would see on the new Mack trucks. It was one of those square grills. He had block. I can still see it. It's crazy. He had the black block letters Mack on the front of the grill and the grill had slots like a grill. It was very satisfying to look at. I, I don't know what it is, but square aesthetic is what I'm using because that word is popular right now. But the square aesthetic of that truck, it was immaculate. <laughs> Toastmasters, they always tell, we always have to challenge ourselves to use words we don't typically use. So I'm getting a chance to try some out right now. But it was immaculate. So it, it was something that I can't describe how it made me feel, how it, how it satisfied me as an artist. But being able to look at that truck and then draw it down to every little detail. He had little swirls, gold swirls on the side of the truck. He had one of those big silver cylinders on e either side. He had a horn on the top. He had four lights at the top. And I think he had a visor. I can't remember, but I think he had a visor. I know he had one on the front. And I remember drawing that truck so many times. I drew it so many times. I could I could never make it perfect enough. It was always to the point where people would say, oh, it's good. But it was never to me, it was never photorealistic. I went from that, I started drawing people. Um, Second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, I won art contest. It wasn't a big deal, but to me it was back then because that was my forte. I loved art. And I remember there was the I Like Me contest and I would always win. I was I would always try to draw the most realistic thing. 
we did these custom magnets. I would always try the hardest picture. They would give you a list of pictures and you could choose one and try to recreate it. And I would always choose the one with the most detail. Anytime I did puzzles, I always wanted the one with the most pieces. I always wanted to do the best. I never wanted to do anything that was less, less than the best or the least challenging. And it's still like that to this day. Um, but yeah, so all the way from first grade, drawing art, kept drawing, kept doing art, fell in love with, with pro wrestling, fell in love with basketball and all these different things. And I started playing video games around second, third grade, whatever, whatever that time frame was. But I would always play. I wasn't allowed to play Grand Theft Auto as a kid. My mom actually did really good making sure because that, that was something I didn't need. But I did get to play all of the wrestling games, all the basketball games. And even during that time frame, I cared about accuracy. In 2003, 2004, the Detroit Pistons won the NBA championship. I knew every member of the roster. I knew the stats for them, the age, the um, height, weight, the college they went to. And I would go into the old games and recreate that team so that it had the updated teams. So, yeah, I was doing that. And I kept doing it. Eventually, that love for art, that deep level of detail, all of that led me to high school where every single year I had an art class. It was to the point where my senior year, they didn't have any more classes for me to take because I've taken them all, but they were able to figure something out and they got me an art class and they created it just for me, essentially just for me because I was the only person that took art every single year. While I was in art, I never finished art projects. We would have a one week time frame to finish an art project. An art project. I would never be happy with what I'd done in that week. So my art project would go from one week to the second to the third week. And the class would have moved on. And it would normally, it's crazy, crazy as it sounds, it would be projects, but most of the time it would be warm ups. These are warm ups that are only supposed to take about five or 15 minutes, however long it was. And my warm ups, I would never finish my warm ups and I would keep going the next day. And I would keep going, I would keep going. So my warm ups that should take one day and you have a new warm up, that will often take me a full week to do the warm up. And then the projects would take me multiple weeks when it were only when it's only supposed to take one week. Somehow I pay, I, I always ace that class, and <laughs> it's so funny when you think about it. My art teacher, I knew, I knew he was my art teacher in sixth grade. He was my art teacher for all of my high school years, and he always used to tell my mom back then. He said Shannon's a great student. He he's he's the he's just, I really shouldn't use the words he said. Um, it wasn't inappropriate, but you know favoritism, whatever. But he said I was I was I was a very talented student. And one of the most talented students in his class, but I never finished my projects. He always just said, I never finished my projects. Back then, I didn't know to take it serious. My mom didn't know to take it serious. I mean, I, I was getting an A, I was getting an A, so why did it didn't matter? But that I'm telling you, these are just some of the things that were impacting me while from a young age where things never felt good enough, or I had to try to get it perfect, like every single detail. If you show me a picture of a galaxy, I would want to get every single star exact. I couldn't just da 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 call it done. I want to get every single dot as close to accurate as possible. And it was an obsession. It wasn't just something I wanted to do. It was an obsession. Like I would actually get frustrated when he would make me pivot from one project to the next because I would say, I'm not done. I haven't finished the project I was on, so why am I moving on? And I would feel as if all of the work that I'd done was a waste because now it was just thrown away for me to move on to something else. What school was actually teaching me is that sometimes that's life. Sometimes you do stuff, you build it, and it doesn't go anywhere. And um, it's not the end of the world. But anything I do, anything I create, I'm extremely attached to it. it, it like I'm, I'm very attached. Which leads me to another thing with OCPD, which is criticism. When you become so attached to something, receiving criticism, any any type of criticism becomes difficult. So you think about people having children. I know this because I have a child now. I know how I am about my child and I'm much better now, but I know how my mother was about me. And I know how many mothers are about their children. And if you say something about a mother's child, a mother's child specifically, a lot of times you'll see a reaction that you probably didn't expect to see. Well, 
mine's a lot toned down. <laughs> uh, as a father, I, I like to look at things and say, okay, well, this is the result or this is the goal. This is what we need to do and it's okay. But with my art, anything I create, I have such a different attachment because my fingerprints are all over it. So anything that is said about it, you can't say, hey, this is due to um, hereditary. This is something that is due to genetics. This is something that is due to environment. You can't really say that. Everything that's created is on me. So if somebody doesn't like the color palette, if they don't like the choice of music, if they don't like the program, if the game is boring, if the... <laughs> it's stressful. I'm kind of stressing myself out talking about this right now. But every single thing, every single element is on the creator, which is why it's helpful if you could work in teams, but that's not always an option. So that is one of the things that still impacts me to this day when I release projects. And it has been so bad sometimes where I can't even read the comments if I know I'm not going to go back and be able to fix it or remedy the comment. I have to just accept that blemish. I'm getting much better with it now. But imagine I'm 20, 29, just had a birthday and I'm 29. Imagine I just, I'll round it and say 20 years. It's around 20 years. Imagine 20 years of that where you always create stuff. It's never good enough. You and your head don't feel as good enough. And then if somebody makes a comment about one thing that could be changed about it, it confirms that it wasn't good enough which then makes you say, okay, well, I need to do it better. I need to always work harder. I need to keep going until it's perfect. All this stuff contributes. It's building, it's building, it's building. Stick with me. So let me talk a little bit now. I've, I've kind of brought you up to speed where I'm in high school. And now let's talk about college. College was never something, I always knew I would go to college for some reason. It wasn't automatic. I knew I was going to college. I never knew where I was going to college until 12th grade where it was probably the middle of 12th grade where I actually started applying for colleges. It just was a given. I didn't think about it as much. And the college that I wanted to go into, I played football there, but I wasn't the best football player. And that bothered me so much because I wanted to be the best. I couldn't catch. That was my biggest thing. I could run into people. I could hit them. I could not catch at all. Like you throw me the ball and, you, and, and, and I'm trying to catch it like this. And it's, I played baseball, could not catch. Uh, which I, I found out not being able to catch and like bad hand eye coordination is actually related to ADHD. Just found this out. I, I looked it up because I was curious. Oh, why can I not catch? I'm strong. I'm fast. But catching the ball, never could do it. Can't catch over my head like this. Every time. I'm, where's it? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? I don't know. So I can't catch. But I can hit. So I played football in college for a year and my stubbornness, my desire to be, I wanted to be the best. Teron Matthew played for um, LSU. I wanted to be Teron Matthew. Discounted all the training, the years of experience he had. This is my first year really playing football. The years of experience, the conditioning, the coaching program, discounted all of that. I said, I'm going to be Teron Matthew on this field. I'm fast, I'm strong, I could do it. Blah, blah, blah. And in my head, I still I still think I was pretty cool. I wasn't good, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, long story short, though, I, I sucked at football. I got injured, and I got a real bad concussion playing football. I messed my shoulder up playing football that year, which still pops out of socket every once in a while. And I was really confused my freshman year because I had no idea what I was going to do, what I was going to do. I switched majors five times. My mother was a nurse, made good money. I thought I'd go do nursing, seems like easy money. I don't like people bleeding, I don't like certain cut, not for me. Okay, how about I go be a lawyer? I heard lawyers make good money. Switched my major to law, law. They told me how much reading I would have to do. Didn't know about my ADHD, but if I'm I'm not interested in the topics, I can't, I can't, I can't focus on it. I can read books, but I cannot focus for long periods of time on reading. I would want it to be over. Just took that out. They had an entrepreneur. They just introduced an entrepreneurship program. Was going through that. Wasn't meshing. It just didn't make sense. Um, then I realized I wanted to do game development. So this was during the summer. So after my freshman year, this was during that summer. I realized I wanted to do game development. And I started teaching myself at home. I was up to 2 a.m. every single night 
during the summertime, teaching myself game development. And all I really learned that, that summer was about dad's studio. And I learned how to take a hit from a picture, take the picture to Face Jam Modeler, and then from Face Jam Modeler, export a head, I think it was a DUL file, with the textures to back to dad's studio as a morph for dad's Genesis. And I was just making, making people. I was making the rappers. I was making rappers in Detroit. And I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a game based in Detroit where it's all rappers, like kind of like Def Jam, like just all the rappers fighting. And I started just making characters that summer. So I went back to college knowing I wanted to do something with game development. They had nothing for game development, they had computer science. That was the closest thing they had was computer science. I switched to computer science, which required me to do a math course and a science course. I took them both at the same time. I got a D in one, got an F in the other one. <laughs> and it's crazy because it wasn't because I couldn't do the work. This was all my, this was all me not knowing how my brain operated at the time. I could not focus in that class. In math, I couldn't focus on anything. All I could think about was going home, making my game. When I was in science, could not focus. All I could think about was going home, working on my game. And then I was working at the same time. So I'm at work thinking about going home, working on my game. So all of this culminated with me ultimately just um, continuing to work on my game. I was working full time, but I knew that at that time college wasn't for me because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no idea where I was going, what I was going to be doing for the rest of my life. Game development seemed so out of my realm of possibility. I had no idea. Nobody around me was doing that. Nobody. And my college did not have it as an option. I had no idea. It's crazy. I'm really putting myself back in my shoes during that time frame because that was a really mentally taxing time for me. Because school, school felt like torture is a strong word. I really don't want to use that. It felt like a chore. That's what it was. It was a chore. It was a it was a formality. I was at school because I had to be at school. But I knew I was leaving so much money on the table. I'm like, I'm getting rich off this game. And um, eventually, I wound up getting um, I put in an application at Quick Loans, Rock and Mortgage, and I worked there for a bit. But they hired me as an instructional designer which I had no idea what that was. Essentially, I would take training content from trainers. They would give me empty training content and I would make it visually appealing, make sure it was formatted correctly. All the different things such as PowerPoints, announcements, workbooks, uh, just all that stuff. CBTs, computer-based trainers. I had to learn about how to really make all of that, not just basic school stuff, but really make it professional where People who were coming to work would see it and say, yeah, that's good. That's that's legit. That's valid. Proofreading. This was something that the OCPD part of me is now I, I like now I can't help but proofread. I see errors. I'm pulling them out of my head. But back then, I would have to proofread other people's work. And I didn't like that. I like the art aspect. What used to get me though, I had two people, and I knew if they proofread my stuff, it was over. Because some people would proofread and you might get 10 to 12 fixes. And it's like, ah, all right, I send it back. They send it back to me. I send it to the trainer. They they review it. They approve it. I send it to the SME, um, subject, matter, subject matter experts. They would review it. All good, green light. But then some of my, tra some of my <laughs> reviewers would, would send back over 100 comments. Over 100 comments. So at this point, I'm like, I'm not good at this. Because every time one of these two individuals gets my content, I'm getting over 100 comments. So why am I in a job that I'm not good at? Is And I would always learn from the same mistakes, some from the mistakes, but then I would make a different mistake. It was like whack-a-mole. And I started getting that feeling again where it's like, man, I'm not good enough for this job. So at some point, they're going to let me go. I'm 19, mind you. I'm 19 years old. And I just was really having this feeling of, what am I doing with my life? I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. And I really, really wanted to do game development that fell through the cracks. But one day, I got an opportunity um, 
there was a training coming up and I was hired by the way. I was, I was told that I was hired because on my resume I had that I was learning game development. So they wanted me to be the person to start doing gamification in the training. I had no idea at the time how to do games though. All I knew how to do was make characters. So my pasta sent through the roof because like, I don't know how to make a game. I don't even know how to package a game. I, I, I barely touched Unity, barely. I could hardly get Unity to open without with a with a plugin, obviously, without it giving me a hundred errors and failing the build. And I didn't know C sharp. I didn't even know about Visual Studio, Visual Studio, Code, C plus plus, um, A B. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know anything about programming. So when I was told that they wanted me to do gamification, I don't know where to start. I I, I just made characters. I'm an artist. I make art. That's about it. I haven't made any games. Well, I get an opportunity to finally make a game because one of my trainers, they come and they say, hey, um, this is the type of content we're doing. We wanted to do a CBT, computer-based training. Could you make us a computer-based training for this? And it was such a loose concept. Now, CBTs, that's where I really got to be creative because it was computer, it was computer, um, it was like an animated PowerPoint, basically. So I didn't have these strong restrictions on me like I was doing document because I, I would always do out the box, out the box stuff. I would use Space Jam characters, the monsters on the document and have each header be a different color of a different monster, which to me, whatever, it, it seemed fun at the, at the time, but um, that's what it was. It was fun. It wasn't serious. I had another one where I actually made a custom icon. It was called Q-Man. And it was supposed to be our, it was a, it was a letter Q with a cape on and a, and a suit and tie, like a tie. And I start putting that on all of my work, having him pop up to do, hey, did you know that? And that, um, that was, people, some people loved it, but it was shut down. So I, I, man, I keep trying to be creative. It's not working. But with that CBT, I got the opportunity to be creative and I made a pseudo game. So it was kind of, it was kind of, it wasn't a fully functioning game, but imagine a game in, a PowerPoint where you can do conditionals and you can say and you can set variables and have variables in it. So it was a game. Like it was a game. It was a CBT. But it wasn't very advanced. So after that, people loved it. I'm like, oh wait, people actually like that? Um one of my assignments, by the way, was to make a 3D character model for every single person in the office. It was over 200 people. I forgot about this. I started it. I got all of the face scans, all the pictures, and I started working on it. And then I got so busy doing instructional design stuff, I just never finished it. So that was how they wanted me to start doing gamification. Where it would have been better if I was to go in now, I would say, no, give me five trainers, make characters for them. We start there, make content based around those five trainers. And then eventually as we get new trainers, we can introduce more content. But they didn't set smart goals and I had no idea at the time how to make smart goals in 19. I wasn't doing that stuff. But now I can do it better. I keep getting lost. There it is. My idea is kicking in. But yeah, that was one of my first times. So after they liked that project, I, want, I made a different project. Now this was something fresh out of my head. I just wanted to try to see if it worked. So it was a phone call simulation training for our people who are on phone calls because normally they just get text and it was interactive. So you have text pop up and it says, hey, this is what the client says. And it gives you three options. You choose the option. And then it says, hey, you chose this option and the conversation continues. It was actually like a choose your own adventure thing. The thing I loved about it though was the audio. I made it where when you hover over the text, you can hear the audio playing. We actually recorded, did voiceovers for it and everything. And at the end, it gave you a score. And it said, hey, you could have done this, 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 and this. The conversation led here because you chose it. It was dope. It was dope. That thing I created, that was the thing that made, when they switched my team, Probably about two weeks later, I had a leader. Her name was Shannon as well. But she said, hey, what do you want to do? Do you want to do games? I said, yes. She was like, cool. You're doing games full time. I was like, what? I couldn't believe it. I'm like, I'm doing games. It's just straight games. Like, no more instruction design. None of just games. I'm hearing you clearly. Games. She said, yes, you're doing games. She's like, what software do you need? Like, I don't know, uh, Unity, <laughs> that's the only thing I'd use. 
And she was like, okay, we'll, we'll figure out Unity. So they were gonna do Unity and it was a pricing thing, it was the licensing. But they said, she came back, she said, well, we can't get Unity, but Unreal Engine has already been purchased for the company and they can get you a seat for that. I'm like, really? I'm like, yes, we're doing Unreal. So she gives me Unreal Engine. Now I'm developing games. So this is where I kind of got into game development now. So I, I was hired on full time by this point and I'm learning Unreal Engine on the clock by trial and error, not anything advanced. First thing I did was the light switch tutorial where you cut a light on. I'm not in C++, I've still never touched C++ to this day for Unreal Engine. I saw probably a couple times where I made little plugins for being able to read files, creating a file dialogue system, that's about it. I saw that I've been able to stick in blueprints and I was using blueprints. I had no ideas about, no idea yet about arrays, no idea yet about maps, no idea yet about data tables, um, no idea yet about game instances and just all the simple stuff. So I was making games and I was manually putting every single question in for, so I would make a different Unreal Engine executable for every single trainer that wanted the game instead of me just going and making one and changing the content on the fly based off of a data table or a save. Learning, this is all growing pains, right? And um, I would go, I would build a game and I would make basic games like Family Feud or, um, it, uh, what was the, what's the name of the movie, man? Captain America, uh, Civil War. Captain America Civil War was really big at the time. So I made a game where it was Captain America and Iron Man on either side. So they were punching each other. Every time one of them got an answer right, they would punch the other one. And as you know, it was like this. One team answered, the other team answered, whoever got it right will punch the other one. If both teams didn't get it right, then they were basically just not doing anything in parry. So that was one of the big games that we got to play in the class where I had them come up, the students would go up, or the trainees, and they would play the game and they would have so much fun. And I made 25 games in the course of me being there of small bite-sized games, but I also made some simulations where they could use different tools. I did simulations, as I mentioned, with the phone call. I did a training simulation where it was the active shooter scenario and this is something real touchy so obviously you know rest in peace to everybody who has been impacted by that my goal when i did a simulation was for people to understand the different procedures of the the, the actual experience that we are required to do i can't remember them off the top of my head now but i think it was um it was i think it was run hide fight i think that's what it was but it, it was a simulation that took you through each step of the process. Again, made no real ending. And eventually I got to the point where the company was making it a big deal. Games, and not my games, just games, just in general. We, we got our own esports team and everything. So I reached out to uh, Dan Gilbert. I sent an email and I said, hey, I work for the company and I make games right now. I want to be part of whatever we do. Somehow, I want to be part. And, um, and what happened after that was, of course, he didn't respond. <laughs> he didn't respond, but his assistants responded. And his assistants connected me with Casey Herbis. And um, Casey was the chief marketing officer. And he probably still is, but he was the chief marketing officer at the time of the company. We met, had a sit down. I had a book of, about this big, a binder of every single game I made while I was there and showcase and said, hey, and then I, I had a team name with the game changes. We had an arcade machine with the games in it. It was a physical arcade machine. Uh, it was amazing, honestly, it was amazing. We went to Arizona, got to go to Arizona and showcase the games, got to go to Afro Tech and talk about my experience at the company as a game developer all on, on the company's dime. So it was a great experience. But I got in the room with Casey, I showed him the document he had, uh, I think she was a marketing coordinator was the official title. Her name was Michelle. She was in there. I just showed them all the games. I said, I want to be part of whatever we do. I want to be part somehow with making games for outside of this company and for, for clients because we have the capacity. We can do it. Again, I'm not an expert at all, but it was just something that I always shoot my shot at, as they say, always, always try. And nothing came out of that meeting for two months then i finally got a call randomly got a call from michelle who was in that meeting and she said hey is this shannon who uh, made the games and i'm like yeah 
She said, hey, we have um, a campaign coming up with Barry Sanders. Big partnership. And we're doing a Snapchat integration. And they told us that we could use video game for it. We have a company that is, you know, one of the charges to make the game. But is this something that you and your team will be able to do? And I'll tell you, I couldn't believe that call came through. I was, I was in shock. So I got to, I got to be the one to tell my team, hey, yo, we have an opportunity because we were still making training games. Like we just, like, we keep pumping training games out. But now I'm telling them, hey, yo, we're about to make a game that is going to be outside of here. People are going to play our game outside of this company. And man. This is another thing. Our teams have merged. So I had the game team I was building in the training, but it was already an established games unit that was in technology. So what they did was they merged our teams. So that team had never done that public facing game either for the company. So this is an opportunity for all of us to come together and build something. We had a lot, about two weeks, I think it was, and we had to come up with the concept. So we had an amazing game designer named Jared, man. He he came up with the concept for the game. I remember we went down to a different floor and just whiteboarded ideas. And we had the idea, um, Mike and Matt, who, man, amazing artists. They did all this art. Mike had to leave, so he didn't get a chance to stay too long because uh, he had a conference, I think. But Matt was able to stay and finish up the, all the artwork. Brian was there. He was able to do some artwork, man. Bongi, who was the programmer for the team, he didn't, he was doing other programming stuff. So then I was the person who had to do, you know, coordinate and everything, but then also I programmed it. So I had to learn a new software, which was Construct, because Construct allowed you to build games for HTML, light enough for HTML that also would work on mobile. I think the issue with Unity was that Unity did not allow WebGL for mobile at the time. So Unity didn't work, but, but Construct did. So we were able to get a license for Construct Built that boy in a week and a half. It became Snapchat's number one ad game of all time during that moment. It was over 800,000 people played that game and it had a 90 second average retention rate, which people who are not in um, marketing, I didn't know this, but that was actually a big deal because it was, we were getting, and then we had telemetry. So we were seeing that people were actually completing the game. People would play the game all the way to completion. And it was called Barry Sanders Dodgeball. It was Barry Sanders playing dodgeball. And it was like an old school retro game, 8-bit game. And it was, it was amazing. So that experience was, again, man, I told y'all, I didn't know where I was going with games. I, I didn't see a future for it. And I had to take that first step in as an instructional designer and then build on one thing led to another, led to another. So built that game. Major success. We felt like rock stars. Not gonna lie. We felt like rock stars because we were obviously companies build, we had people building websites and that's public facing and all that stuff is public facing, but to build a game was something different because we weren't a game studio and we were able to build a game and work directly with Snapchat to deploy the game and everything else that came with it, which was like, yo, this is a huge deal. So, we did that, and a couple months later, we get another ring, same folks, but it's a different marketing coordinator this time. And she reached out and said that did that um, Quicken was doing a partnership with Marvel for Infinity War. Infinity War, you know, Marvel's Infinity War, the biggest. This was up to Endgame, I think, because I think Endgame surpassed it. But this was Marvel's, girl, this is the biggest game. I mean, biggest movie that they ever done. And it might've been one of the biggest growth, um, highest grossing movies of all time. I think Titanic or Avatar was number one, whatever it was. We knew it was gonna be big. We were losing our crap when we got that call. And they said, we want to do a game tie in because of the success of the Barry Sanders game for Marvel's Infinity War. It's like, what? Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. And that was legit. Marvel sent us a, uh, it's funny now where I'm at now, but um, yeah, whatever. But Marvel sent us a big, uh, it was a document. And it was, hey, these are the characters you can use. These are the characters you can't use because the movie was, it, it was, um, nobody knew anything. It was 
tight lip. So we didn't know who all was in it. We didn't know who all was gonna die. We didn't know any of that stuff. So it was very, even the information we got was very tight lip. It was like, hey, these are the characters you can use. If you use any characters, these characters have to be in pairs and these characters have to be in pairs and all these different things. So and now I'm thinking, man, we could have done a lot more, but it's cool. We could have done a lot more because I think we had the rights to use some of the characters and we didn't really use the characters, but it's fine. But it was the same process. Crafting the idea, we had a little bit more time this time. So we tested it out, fixed bugs, again, built in construct. And that game did well enough. Um, I think my, my biggest, I don't remember all the stats on that, but I think my biggest victory on that, what made me so happy is we were able to integrate custom filters where once you beat levels of the game, you could actually unlock a filter and it would, I mean, unlock a piece of a filter. And then once you finish the whole game, you would get a new Snapchat filter unlocked, which would have the Infinity War graphics on it. It was an awesome treatment. Um, but yeah, that was awesome. Then we did a couple more projects, did some augmented reality stuff with NCAA. And I started to have ideas about doing a virtual reality space because I wanted to get into that. So I wanted to build a virtual reality room and I, I, I did it. I got a building, bought all the equipment, built a couple of little custom experiences and had no idea how to market it. Couldn't bring a single person to it. I only stayed open for a week. Wound up my job, it was a funky situation with that, so I wasn't at that company anymore. And this was the first time, this was back in 2019, this was the first time where I felt like I was back in college, where I didn't know where I was doing, going next. I had no idea. I said, I was just on top of the world. <laughs> I was just making games for Marvel and Barry Sanders and the NCAA. Now I'm um, um, in my childhood church in the office, obviously a priest still and blessed, watching Roster on YouTube, Roster on and listening to Big Fry on YouTube talk about failed indie games. Oh, I never mentioned, by the way, I built, I released another game during that time, which was Scrap City. That game had over 20,000 people downloaded between iOS and Android, and I made no money off of it because I didn't know how to monetize properly. And that was the game with the Detroit rappers. I finally wound up releasing it, and it, it didn't monetize properly, so I wanted to rebuild it. I tried rebuilding it, and it just... I rebuilt the whole game for a year and released it and didn't market it. So nobody knew about it. So I took it down because I didn't like it. And I did that so many times. So I'm not even telling y'all about all the field projects during this time. It was so many projects where I was started and I would stop it. I had a skateboarding game I wanted to do with, um, it was a YouTuber, X7 Albert. I wanted to make a skateboarding game for him. I wanted to make a skateboarding game in Detroit. Why I wanted to make a skateboarding game, I grew up playing Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4. As simple as that. I wanted to make a game like that. I had an independent wrestling game I wanted to make during the time. I couldn't do it. Whole bunch of other games that I just, I, I would try, but I never would make it happen. Um, but yeah, I was I was sitting, I was listening to YouTubers talk about indie fail games. And at this point, I'm like, man, I just got my college degree. So I just graduated college. And I said, I need to start doing more 3D art. Or I was getting ready to graduate college. I'm like, I need to start doing more 3D art. I started doing that. I came out from my College graduation, probably about a month and a half later, out to Florida. I graduated valedictorian somehow of my 3D arts class, and it hit me. I said, holy crap, I'm actually good at this 3D art stuff. I had no idea. Maybe I need to step back into the, maybe I need to move. <laughs> and that's what it was like, maybe I need to step into the, maybe I need to move. That's immediately what I did. My now wife, she's my girlfriend at the time, I called her and I said, I'm moving to Florida. I'm serious. I said, I'm moving to Florida. I said, I know that's a big move. So I would love to have you come with me. But if you don't come with me, I understand. But I got, got to go. And if I graduated August 19th, I moved out here officially October 7th. That's how serious I was. That's, how, that's basically a month and a half. I got back home. I started doing some research. Yeah, I had to get my dates right. Yeah, 
I got home, I started doing research on apartments and cities out here where I could move, found a place to move. And when I found the place to move, um, I actually had found two places, but when I found the place to move, I made the phone call, did the application process, sent my deposit, everything. And I was supposed to move in January. Well, when I called back, I, I wanted to find out that they actually had a room available in October, which was the room that I wanted to be in. So I moved it up to October and I told my family, I said, y'all, I love y'all, but I gotta go. I gotta go because I'm sinking in Detroit. I'm, I'm sinking. And I don't want to keep making games that is just about violence because I live here. I actually live here. So I'm putting out content for people. And when they come up to me and say, hey, I love your game, I played your game. Although it may make you feel good in the moment because it's like, hey, somebody appreciates my work. It's also a thing where, are you really proud of who you are? And this is another thing with OCPD that I think a lot of people deal with, but the morality part of, am I doing the right thing? Because that was something that I, I've always battled with that, with gaming. It's like, how does this impact? If I'm on earth, because I'm grown up Christian, if I'm on earth to spread the word of God, help people come to God, how was me making a game about violence, shooting, killing? How does that do anything to serve that purpose? It didn't. So I was just starting to really realize that my heart was not in that. And I started working on my wrestling game during that time, which is Mark Out, which is still on Steam. I'm proud to say that game is still on Steam and it has a 95% positive rating still. If it goes down, I don't even care if the rating goes down. It's been 95% for three years now. And that was a game I built when I was unemployed, when I was down and I had released it when I had my first child and I was married at the time. So it was a pro that that's a game of life for me. That's a game that I, I, I had a journey with that game. But yeah, told my family I was out and loved them. We wanted to go on a cruise, right? We got here, we got a, we had a cruise that, and I didn't even do this on purpose. The cruise was already planned, I think. But we got in to our home and went on the cruise. My The rest of my family flew out and we went on the cruise two days after we moved in. We hadn't even unpacked everything. I didn't have a job. I came out here with no job. Didn't know what I was gonna do. I was doing freelance work, but I had no career anymore, no plan. And I started reaching out to people. Jameson Durrell, great, great person right there, man. He was one of the first people that he actually sat down and had a meeting with me. And he told me, said, if you want to do gaming at any company, he works at Insomniac now, man. He worked on the Spider-Man game stuff. He was killing me. He said, if you want to make any money or have a career in gaming, because that's what I was trying to do now, he said, you need to focus on one discipline. He was like, focus on one discipline and, and get good at it. Because I was a jack of all trades. I never had formal training, never did any of that. I was, however, a 3D artist. And I had my degree in 3D art and I knew I could do that. So I thought that would be it. Also met with um, Tom LaCroix, who was the, he was the, uh, I forgot his title now, but he was the vice president at Pulisell. He was doing something. And I remember reaching out to him when I was on the cruise. I was able to get reception on LinkedIn. And I told him before I moved, I said, hey, I'm planning on moving. We'd love to just connect, get coffee. And he actually, agreed to it um and after he agreed man the 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 vibe was off the charts when i was meeting people out here in florida everybody was so open they were so given of their time their knowledge their expertise um and he was one of the people where he helped me get my first position out here because of the team he was over at the time so i was training at the team for now this is now we're getting closer to November, I think we're in November, December, and I'm working at Full Sail training for two weeks. I'm still training. They're training me on the phones and how to how to handle all this stuff. And I'm happy, man. I'm like, I'm in Florida. Like, it's nothing you can tell me. I'm in Florida. I'm happy. I'm I'm at peace. I'm finding a job. Even if I'm being on the phones, that's something. That's some money. So I was getting ready to do that and I was training for two weeks and I got my first call from Disney. And I've basically been at Disney since then. Something, you know, COVID happened, but I walked right back with the company. I was at a game studio at Steamroller Studios for uh, about a month and a half 
before my internship called me back at Disney. And when I was there, I was an Unreal Junior developer. So I was developing in Unreal. Um, yeah, I just realized that I completely missed the purpose of this video. And I'm an hour long. I'm at an hour long. I got some of the purpose out the way. I think I'm gonna end this video so it can upload successfully. And I'm gonna start a new video. And the next video, that one's gonna be more geared towards um, game development and mental health. So I already did the story. This will be a part one. I'm gonna do a part two. Peace. If you don't see the next video, I'll see you hopefully down the line. But make sure you keep fighting for your life. Peace.